Um, morning, everyone. Thank you for making time for my session. Um, the pressure's on. I'm optimistic that some of what I have to say resonates. I also invite debate, disagreement, etc., because it's the only way we learn, etc. But uh, much of this is, it's just aimed at being practical information to consider when you're trying to put together your own cyber threat intelligence program. Now, I normally don't do about me's, but I hear they're nice icebreakers. Um, so as you can see, I'm a very short but big nerd. Uh, next picture you'll see my, uh, my favorite thing, uh, my favorite uh, um, beings on earth. Um, I have ASD, I, I have Asperger's. The nice thing about Asperger's is that I can spot patterns in data really easily and I have a bunch of other analytical skills that I believe my ASD has helped me enhance over time without it being much of an effort. What I'm awfully bad at though is reading a room. Um, this bites me in the ass sometimes when I'm lecturing because uh, especially in, 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 um, when you're in a scenario where you're doing webinars, you can't see how bored your audience is, that they are absolutely dying to go and have something to eat. And often I get interrupted and asked, can we please break? You, you're 15 minutes over our lunch. <laughs> um, I'm going to do my best not to do that. Um, I'm also a very, very prolific gamer. It's my, it, I would say it's probably my only real hobby. Work, work, work uh, experience wise, I started out at what was then Cape Tech, doing programming, realized I hated it, moved on to help this get the now defunct units of Africa, moved on to network operations, moved overseas, did a little bit more network operations and systems administration, moved back home for various reasons. I'm very glad I did. Um, ended up back at another ISP and then I decided I'm really bored and I need a new challenge. And this dumbass decided that challenge should be, I wonder if I'd be any good at managing people. Yeah. <laughs> right. But that has been a very long, interesting, oddy with sometimes incredibly frustrating journey. And my poor partner has been put through hell and back listening to me rant and rave about that. However, work experience, like I said, started out in help desk. It was actually an internet casino. That was even worse, illegal. Um, moved to knock, then help desk. Um, I, I managed to land a job at UCT um, as a help desk manager. Then I moved on to educational technology services, which I had no interest in, but it was a brand new project that we're kicking off, lasted five years to refurb and bring IT, IT and AV into the 21st century because most of UCD's lecture venues were still using overhead projectors, which judging from the age groups in the room, many of you will remember from primary school. <laughs> so um, yeah, so from EdTech, I moved into I actually didn't move into, but rather moved back. Because a lot of, of what I missed being in management was the technical component of the work because it's actually technology that I love, not telling PT, are you late again? You know, this is the 10th time and I'm gonna have to call HR. Um, and m most of my background these days is information and cybersecurity related, but my big passion is actually digital forensics. But there are many marriages between all of that, so, but that's a talk for another day. And I am, for my sins, after I left UCT three years ago, I joined a MSSP, let's all collectively groan at once. I'm not selling anything. Um, the sales team loves me because I just, I won't. Um, and I'm also currently CISO for the MSSP that I work for. Is this better? Um, I'll be happy to answer most questions, but I also need to be mindful about some of the NDAs I've signed. So where I can easily answer a question if there are any, happy to, where I can't, it's not because I don't know the answer, it's because I can't give it to you. If I don't know the answer, though, I will tell you. <clears throat> right. Um, 
I tend to take a very Venn diagnostic approach to my, my talks, despite working for MSSP, and because this is a practical talk, not a buy this or else you'll have, in, have to listen to my FUD for the next few hours. Great. So um, I specialize in these days building um, computer security incident response teams. I built the one at UCT. We got, we, I still call them we because I worked there for so long, first.org accreditation, first higher ed institution in, on the continent to get it. I hope, and my previous colleague can tell me that we still have it, um, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I also build socks, and that's why I got poached by MSSB to build a sock for them. My latest interest is actually crypto and blockchain forensics, but that's not what this talk is about. Um, I do love to learn. I'm a, I'm a lifelong learner. I'm also a semi-regular guest lecturer, um, usually at WITS. UCT has an awesome meanwhile. And even though I love to learn, you might identify with this part too. I suffer from extreme imposter syndrome. I, and to that end, I would appreciate feedback after the presentation from any of you who would like to give me any regarding the parts that you found useful or enjoyed and the parts you think I could have tackled differently or I wasn't clear about. It just helps me evolve how I explain the concepts, how I create these talks. Um, fun fact, attended first B-Sides in 2011, organized out of uh, ICTS building on main, um, Mowbray Main Road, room 203, and uh, gave a lightning talk of which I cannot remember, but I, I know this happened, and um, the internet says it happened, so it has happened. Um, and I, another fun fact, uh, at one point, um, you, you don't know her, but Sam sitting there in the corner, and I once were fortunate enough to get the Hawks for a full day and teach them how to conduct a, a digital forensics imaging exercise using completely legal principles. <laughs> it was an eye-opener training the hawks on how to do it, but I thought it was fun. Because um, and what we stressed to them was, remember, this needs to be done in a legally admissible way. <laughs> All right, so why this topic? I get tired of reading of or listening to FUD when it comes to our industry. I prefer practical approaches to solving problems rather than throwing tons of money and expensive tools at a problem only for your vendor to walk away and go, bye now, I'll send you a renewal in about 10 months just to remind you I exist. So, cool. So, I hope you like the title. Another colleague of mine came, a previous colleague of mine actually came up with it. I wish it was mine, I thought it was great. I asked her permission, she said, yeah, go for it. Then I asked if she wanted to join me for the talk, and she said, <laughs> nice try. <laughs> OK. So my children, um, none of my slides are complete without them. That's them behaving. So we, we, we're just going to leave, leave it at that, because uh, they often don't. Um, but what's the big deal, right? Um, again, like I said earlier, I would appreciate your f any and all feedback that's constructive afterwards um, that can help me grow and improve. And, um, but why, yeah, so I mentioned that this topic particularly got tired of the FUD. I like the practicable approach, but what is it the problem that we try and solve with CDI? What is the purpose of cyber threat intelligence? So, very briefly, it helps us make faster and more informed and, importantly, fact-based security decisions and helps uh, our analysts change their behavior from being reactive to proactive in the fight against malicious actors. CTI can help us map our organizational threat landscape. It can help us calculate risk, so, um, and give security personnel, the intelligence and context that they need 
to make more efficient decisions. It can help us collect, analyze, and share information about potential security threats. I'm going to talk a little bit more about collaboration and sharing later because I know I'm going to get ahead of myself and then repeat myself and then forget I've repeated myself. So I'm just going to stick to the slides. Okay. Um, some of what I said <clears throat> in the blurb was that I wanted to do a little overview on why cybercrime is an important issue to pay attention to. Now, I know I need, uh, I'm preaching to the entire choir, so I'm going to leave this, I'm going to leave this as brief as possible, just if, if you think about it. <clears throat> In terms of this research that a, a company called Surfshark did, we rank as fifth in the world in terms of cybercrime density. And that the percentage of cybercrime um, <clears throat> victims in South Africa, among a specific number of internet users, it's actually, it's just continuously increasing. Globally, you're looking at roughly 801,000 people falling victim to a cybercrime incident worldwide. Uh, this, and that, those stats are about 18 months old. Uh, that results in losses of billions. And um, common threats, you've heard all of them before. You've probably got three or four tools for each of them, just so we have defense in depth. Phishing was obviously first. Online payment fraud was second. Extortion. Tech support scams. Who doesn't have an elderly relative who's called you and gone, there's this thing that's popped up on my machine that says I need to phone this number and give them my credit card because they found problems on my machine. And I'm exaggerating for effect, but I had one of those two, day two days ago. How long was on that call for? Two hours? No, you know, it's... I think what's key is it, it's always going to be about education and awareness. So, for example, I managed my mother's cell phone device. I locked it down and I deleted a whole lot of apps I knew she didn't need. And she is none the wiser. I'm not going to go through any more of these stats. I'm conscious that you didn't come here for death by PowerPoint. <laughs> but those are rather damning numbers. Um, and investment fraud was the most financially devastating cybercrime worldwide in 2022. Happy to share um, slides, um, I, I imagine, post this. And I'm also happy to add all my sources so that you know I didn't just go, oh, which number sounds sexier? <clears throat> Right, our crisis. When I, I, I borrowed this slide from another talk I did for universities and then I realized, whoops, I better really move all the references to universities from them, one and two. A couple of them were ones that I have actually had to do work for and NDA and all that stuff. So I don't need to spell out the cyber crisis for you. Um, but what I can tell you is the CS <clears throat> the CSIR hosted a hybrid info session in about April this year uh, under the theme of cybercrime in South Africa, an introspective look. It's always introspective with no solutions. Their findings, based on the research that, that they undertook, shows that South Africa is under siege. Um, there have been some significant business plans to spend about 25% more on cybersecurity in the next three years. Under siege may sound incredibly dramatic, but we're also becoming more and more desensitized to major security incidents and breaches because we're reading about them virtually every day. And now we barely blink when we read about them any longer. It's a bit like our apathy, or rather, not necessarily ours, but the apathy that you may have experienced with people who live in South Africa about the crime rate. We have become desensitized to the fact that we are under siege. And in, 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 in our, our personal lives, to, to our criminals, but just as much um, virtually by cyber, <coughs> by cyber criminals. Um, I am wary that I have a soft voice. If you can't hear me, shout. I'll try and talk louder. Okay. 
So more lovely stats. Um, so Microsoft, Mimecast uh, did a state of um, email security to support um, the, the statistics that show that 97% of their respondents are targeted by email-based phishing. Um, th this was their seventh survey that was um, conducted in depth and globally, and South Africa was included in the stats for change. So, um, and responses were actually garnered from, from about 13 countries, ranging from your first world right down to your developing countries. With great power comes great responsibility. But we struggle with limited cyber budgets to protect against large-scale attacks and budget being mostly allocated to activities that keep an organization profitable or running, depending on what, you, on what type of organization you have. So the scarcity of cybersecurity skills um, means that most institutions don't have dedicated teams for info or cybersec, and many can't afford the salaries required to attract experienced and or qualified analysts. I'm drawing a distinction between experienced and or qualified for a reason. We are not health professionals, and I've had many HR arguments with people about putting in I want an NQF 8 for that senior technical specialist role because that will prove to me the person studied. Yeah, what psychology? You want, you want to be able to get a task for a, a workforce and, and, and hire a bunch of people who have proven experience, whether they got it watching a ton of YouTube videos, which there's absolutely nothing wrong with, or whether they did it by Going to the Wayback Machine and seeing what we used to do in Baltal days. Oh God, I'm really am old. Etc. You know, the fact of the matter is there is a, a cybersecurity skills gap, and we do struggle with the lack of competitive salaries. And depending on where you're in South Africa, you struggle more, because if you're stuck in Pofader, you're going to be earning a fraction of what somebody doing the same work in. Cape Town or Johannesburg would be doing, for example. Moore's Law, we all know Moore's Law, <laughs> talks to us about the rate of change in technology. And um, when it comes to the rate of change in tech and malicious activities, the, the, that rate of change makes it incredibly difficult for organizations to keep up with the pace of digital evolution. Great, things are evolving, malicious actors are evolving their tools. Me, I am licensed for that for so many months more, so I guess I'm gonna keep to that and tell my team, why aren't you doing more with it? And an another big problem is that most institutions, through no fault of their own, for the most part, UCT, looking at you, use legacy or, uh, and, uh, and um, end-of-life systems and infrastructure due to burgeoning costs, poor forex rates, and the fact that the majority of the budget is going to go into whatever most uh, feeds that organization and the work that it's meant to achieve, whether it's a private sector um, company that's in it to make money, or a college, or university, or a learning institution. The, the emphasis is never on please let give please please here's more money to spend on IT. Or absolutely here's a bajillion squids for you to go run a better security program for me. A lot of the time, the the financial decision makers don't actually see the value in what we do with with our security tools because they can't see a ROI until something bad happens. And we don't want something bad to happen. That's why we ask for these things. Okay. There's also a huge reliance on third parties and contractors. Supply chain attacks are, are on the rise. SolarWinds, Microsoft, do I name any new ones? Um, yeah, 
as an Octa customer, I really enjoyed reading their, um, <laughs> their latest admission. Oh, yeah. No, that, that was a very late night. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, well, there's also a lack of coordinated and structured response to cyber risk across departments. I also believe there's not, and like my last line for this slide is that there's a lack of cyber awareness among staff, but I also believe there's a lack of awareness of what cyber risk looks like. And, and really that when you're drawing up your pretty little risk register, where the heck is security on it? It, it actually underpins all the work that you do, whether you want it to or not, whether you like that fact or not. I'm seeing far too many risk registers that have security as an afterthought. Yeah. Right. Oh, bring on the bad guys. So, some, some common um, security threats. Again, preaching to the choir, so I'm going to go through this one pretty quickly. Phishing. No. Always number one, and I think we all know why criminals send convincing looking emails posing as legitimate entities to trick them into revealing sensitive info. Um, the, the other part of phishing attacks is now how do I protect myself against QR code scams? Yikes. So our, our adversaries are advancing the technology that they use to circumvent our systems faster than we can even keep up with the knowledge that they're gaining to know how to plug the holes that they're finding. Then there's ransomware, not going to talk about that. Data breaches, don't need to tell you the result of data breaches. Um, insider threats, they don't often come up, but but they actually, one of the, damn it, I, re, I was about to give an example and I realized I couldn't. But needless to say, I've worked with a good few insider threats and they can come from current or former colleagues um, who either misuse their access privileges intentionally or accidentally um, and share um, sensitive information but sometimes, sometimes I think one of the things we should be looking at when it comes to our insider threat is the people who are being targeted by syndicates. What are their financial situations? That it, um, and how is that information so easily available that the syndicates know who to start targeting to get little bits of info at first and then up the ante and up the ante and up the ante. Uh, DDoS attacks. Don't have to tell you more about that. Unpatched software and vulnerabilities, the absolute bane of my life. Um, weak passwords, the fact that mo so many organizations I've spoken to don't want to implement MFA because it's yet another step. In fairness, in the South African context, Trying to implement MFA at a university is incredibly difficult for a multitude of reasons. The socioeconomic conditions that students live under mean that not many of them can afford smartphones that can have an author um, app in, in, installed so that they can generate a, a, a random OTP. So these are all, you know, they, they sound like no-brainers, but we also have to consider the South African context. Then social engineering, oh man, I love the social engineering one because I actually have used it, done it very successfully, didn't exploit it, but did it to prove a point. There's also your third party risk and a lot of the breaches that we hear about over the seas often seem to stem from a third party not having the necessary security in place or logging into their Gmail account while they're on their work device, blah, blah, etc., cetera, and, and so forth. The proliferation of bringing your own device in IRT, that, that's another reason why, why we're facing so many cyber threats. Um, and mostly because we don't know how to properly secure them. Then there's your 
compliance and regulatory challenges. Depending on the nature of your organization's business, they must adhere to various data protection regulations where non-compliance can lead to legal, reputational, and financial consequences. Um, I want to end with this thought before the next slide. Remember, your, your adversaries, your malicious actors, they only need to be, they only need to be successful once. We, we need to be plugging a mul multitude of holes constantly and in search of more. But, yeah, on to the next one. So, MacGyver's Marvels. I think this was a... Oh, yeah, there's the writing. So, you, I'm sure most of you remember MacGyver. It's also a verb these days, if you read the Merriam-Webster um, uh, dictionary. And it's a verb to talk about making or forming or repairing something um, using what you just what you have around what you have around you. <clears throat> so, in the face of seemingly insurmountable challenges, we all possess a remarkable gift: the gift of MacGyverism, which is the art of finding ingenious solutions in the most unexpected places. Those intrepid souls who can turn a paperclip into a lifeline or a cardboard box into a sanctuary and a humble rubber band into a force of nature. And now we're going to dive into some strategies to combat security threats and how you can MacGyver your own bag of tricks to create a budget-conscious CTI program. Uh, quick question, how many minutes do I have left? Ten. Oof, I better rush. Great. Okay. So some strategies to combat your threats. So, uh, security awareness training, do this as regularly as possible and don't be punitive about it. Use it as a learning exercise rather than, you, you're duffed up again, you clearly never listen. Patch management, it's, it seems simple, but it's just never ever uh, consistently done. Access controls, implement strong access controls, including your MFA, including your least privileged access, all in the name of limiting exposure to your insider threat. Have an incident response plan. No, not something you grabbed off the internet, made a few adjustments to put your company name on and went boom. Here we go, ISO 27001, here's my incident response plan. <laughs> Just so I can meet that control. Um, then data encryption as well. In, in, in ensure your data is being encrypted in if sensitive data, sorry, is encrypted both in transit and at rest to protect it. Collaboration. Collaboration for me is probably and the the first speakers touched on on collaboration, but I find there's this absolute dearth of people willing to collaborate with peer institutions or even each other to share threat intelligence to stay informed about emerging threats and best practices. Yes, there are the ISACs uh, for, for, for various sectors, but there's no real um, civilian level ISAC movement um, as, as it may be, and this is something I've been giving a lot of thought to. Also ensure you have regular security audits and assessments. Um, these help you to identify vulnerabilities in areas for improvement, but caveat, um, make sure that whatever you're getting audited against is actually relevant to your organization. If you're not a bank, do you really need to go the whole hog, etc. And then, of course, vendor risk management is really important. And organizations must continuously adapt their cybersecurity strategies to address evolving threats and ensure the safety and integrity of their digital environments. Boom. Okay. So... Why this topic? What's the purpose of cyber threat intelligence? It helps us make faster, more informed, and fact-based security decisions. It also helps us change our behavior from reactive to proactive in the fight against malicious actors. It can help us map our organizational threat landscape, calculate the risk, and give security personnel the intelligence and context to make more efficient and intelligent decisions. It can also help us collect, analyze, and share, there's that share word again, information about potential security threats with our peers, with trusted groups. 
and obviously TLP it. Okay, um, I asked ChatGPT to give a nice definition. Um, as you can see, it, it wrote something pretty. I, I like to describe it like this. It's the process of gathering and analyzing info about potential and actual cyber threats in order to better understand, anticipate, and respond to them. This info can include your IRCs, your indicators of compromise, tactics, techniques, your, your TTPs, um, vulnerabilities, threat, and threat actors. It's used by organizations to identify and assess cyber threats and to develop effective strategies to prevent, detect, and respond to them rather than go, whoops, need to plug. Use a Band-Aid and move on until the next big flood. There are many different types of cyber threat intelligence. Um, I'm just going to read them because I'm running out of time, because somebody can't tell the time, me. Um, but you get strategic, tactical, operational, technical, hum int, OSINT, love it. Used it several times for a couple of forensic courses very success, uh, um, cases very successfully. There's closed source, there's your indica indicators of compromise, vulnerabilities, geopolitical, and industry specific. If any of you actually want more info, uh, very happy to be cornered somewhere and we can have a conversation. Cyber threat, um, CTI components. So you get your data collection phase, it's the initial phase, you're gathering data from various sources in your internal logs, your external feeds, your open source intelligence, and your closed source intelligence. What a lot of people fail to realize is that your CTI doesn't have to be in a beautifully packaged platform before it's CTI. Your network is a veritable wealth of lots and lots of CTI that you just need to know and learn how to use and harness better and share with other with with trusted peers in, 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 so that in in some cases if they haven't yet seen a particular IOC they are now in the proactive mode you reactively found it but they get to be proactive data processing once you collect the data process it to remove the noise and irrelevant info um, and analysis, very critical component where a skilled analyst examines the process data to identify patterns, trends, and potential threats. Analysts use their expertise to understand the context and relevance of the information. Context, contextualization. Context is so, so important. It's more valuable when it's placed in context of what it is that you need to protect for your organization and what, it, what type of business or work your organization is involved in. So analysts can provide context by linking threats to specific vulnerabilities and, and attack um, techniques, potential targets, etc. It also helps organizations assess the severity and relevance of threats that they are facing. Threat feeds. Oof. Always contentious. So there are external sources of threat intel and organizations subscribe to or they monitor. And these provide them with continuous updates on known threats, known IOCs, and emerging attack techniques. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think I need to tell you what an IOC is, so I'm just going to move on to the next one. But what I do want to say about TTPs that it's really important to understand how TTPs are used by malicious actors against your organization so that you can and start working towards anticipating and defending against those types of cyber attacks or th that either meet with those TTPs or similar tactics. Attribution. While challenging, attribution involves identifying individuals, groups, or, or nation states behind an attack. Attribution can inform response strategies and help organizations understand threat actor motives. Actionable intelligence. Very important that oh, there's, there's this, you can get so much threat intel from loads of paid for and free feeds, but you know, it's like, how relevant is it to me right now in, in what I'm doing, in the work that my company is doing, etc. and so forth. So, <clears throat> it, um, yeah, so it definitely helps making more informed decisions, but also being able to take appropriate actions. 
reporting. Um, so for the findings and insights from the analysis of C, uh, CTI are often documented in reports. These reports can vary in complexity from brief summaries to detailed assessments depending on the intended audience. But I challenge you to consider when last one of your vendors sent you a report and you actually read the thing end to end. Was it useful to you? And if it wasn't useful, and if you did do it, and it wasn't useful to you, it's up to you to go to your vendor and say, this is not the kind of info that I'm paying you for. What I need is this, because I need a far earlier alerting system than the one you're giving me one week or one month after the events have happened. Um, info sharing internally. Once analyzed, intelligence uh, needs to be shared with relevant stakeholders within your organization, like your IT teams, your security teams, and executives, to help facilitate that the most informed decisions can, can be made and responded to. Integration. Uh, <clears throat> CTI should be integrated into an organization's security infrastructure. And that can include, if you have one, your SIM systems, your IDSs, and other security tools. Integration helps you to automate the threat detection and response. So rather than you pouring over, yikes, dozens and dozens of entries for hours on an end, uh, a platform that's being configured correctly with the feeds that you want to see will actually pop out answers at you a little faster and do a, a level of verification, the feedback loop. Um, the feedback loop is essential for improving the quality of the threat intel. Organizations should gather feedback from their incident response activities and use that to refine their intelligence processes. In information sharing externally, in some cases, information is shared with trusted partners, industry groups, or government agencies to collectively defend against threats <clears throat> and, and contribute to um, broader threat awareness. There are ISACs globally, like I mentioned earlier, that also show you threat intel that's sector-based. In the UK, there's an initiative that the NCSE is running called CISP. Um, unfortunately, you need to be working in the UK to sign up for it, but it's free. And CISP pretty much stands for Connect, Inform, Share, and Protect. They do follow the TLP protocol as well, so you know your data is safe if you decide to make something not TLP white, for example. And the other important part is that the CISP service actually allows professionals to collaborate uh, on cyber threats in a confidential uh, and secure way. So collectively, these components all work together to create a comprehensive program that can help an organization proactively identify and respond to the information security threats, which ultimately will also help them enhance their overall security posture. I am not going to talk about the pyramid of pain because you all already look like you are in pain. But one thing I do want to say is it's a topic on its own, which is also why I wasn't going to talk about it. But I did want to highlight that it is important in relation to CTI and here's why. It's become a cornerstone of many CTI teams and platforms because they use it to guide um, it's used to guide just, okay, what am, what am I going to concentrate on? It represents visually how your IOCs are more difficult for an adversary to change than others, etc. and so forth. Um, PIC has actually released a paper saying, well, they don't quite agree with the pyramid of pain. They think it needs a couple of changes. I'm not including that in that. I still think there's a lot of value in this. But the one last thing I want to want to mention about the permit of pain is, would you really be waste, want to waste all your time on hash values which are tr listed as trivial because you can change them in seconds? Or are you going to worry about the TTPs which once you've identified how, how, what your adversaries are, are doing um, against your environment and made a modification to prevent the tactic from working next time, they now need to put in extra effort to either build a new tool or buy a new tool. In other words, what you've done is made it more difficult for them to break into your systems, meaning they move on to SAMS. Because, oh, no, uh, I'm not touching that one. Uh, less effort, please.
I didn't sign up to do this for 16 hours for no paper, for, no, for, for absolutely no success. So yeah, so eventually they'll just move on to easier targets. Um, yeah. Creating your budget conscious CTI program. Important to, I can go into this in greater depth, but I have a sense that I'm not gonna be able to. Define your objectives and scope, assess your available resources, use open source intelligence, it's there. Collaborate with industry groups where possible. Um, if, if, a, if an industry group won't collaborate with you, create your own. I'm sure you'll find other like-minded people who will want to be part of that type of initiative. <coughs> Consider the use of free and or low cost CTI feeds and tools. Automate, automate, automate. The harder you make the, the, the job of actually um, analyzing and bringing together your, your feeds, the less inclined your analysts are going to be to even want to look at them. Invest in training. Also, prioritize threats in relation to the business that your organization most uh, conducts, but also the threats that they most often uh, are um, attacked by. Create a basic incident response plan. Once you've created it, uh, use it. <laughs> Not some pretty document to go and add to your ISMS. Look, look, auditor, I've got this too. Um, I'm not ripping at auditors. It, it, I have to sit through so many of these audits, but it's and and so similar problems often creep up. Create a feedback loop. Implement basic security hygiene. Keep informed of trends and threats. Seek free training and resources if 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 your organisation is unable to send you unpaid for ones. Think about outsourcing, but not too hard. Um, like I said, I'm not here to sell a thing, um, and. I, I've always been of the opinion that I'd rather try and build something myself first than spend money on a tool that I don't understand yet. Also, don't forget to measure the efficacy of the program that you put together once you put it together. Caveats. Very short list, yay. So just remember, in your journey of creating your own CTI program, all indicators are not created equally, which means you shouldn't necessarily be spending the same amount of time analyzing all of them. Look at the ones that you've already decided or make the, uh, what may have the most impact on your organization. Verify your IRCs. Do not try to cover every single TTP that the MITRE framework tells you to because you're going to cry, one, and two, it's unnecessary. Look at the ones that are actually relevant to your organization. Make use of threat aggregators. They will make your life so much easier. And don't stop learning and innovating. I think I'm really done. Um, oh, yeah, so just some information. I'm not gonna go through this because it's really, these are some of the tools of the trade. What I did find very interesting, and I do wanna mention this before I am probably carried out of here, is that um, so the, I actually went to read up some white papers and there, there was a combination of um, uh, commercial and open source and vendor threat feeds combined uh, that it's been found they provide the best benefit. But some research, I um, can't remember the precise university names, it was, it was actually fairly recently that, that, the, that this was done. But what, what was found was that there wasn't any real overlap between the, uh, the open and the, and the paid threat intel feeds in, in terms of indicators. The other question that people who bought paid for feeds were asked were, um, did you find the free ones useless? And they said, no, actually, we just found them noisy and we liked the fact that these were already curated to our environment. So, some food for thought for you when considering do I use open source or do I use paid for feeds, that if you're willing to put in the time to curate your open feeds to show you only what's important to you, there's no massive difference between what you, between, um, what you get when you buy one versus what you get when you, cur when you curate the open source ones. 
some platforms to consider if any of you want to take a screenshot. Um, also, advantages of using the, such a platform, of using CTI platforms. Automation is wonderful. Automation when coupled with SIM and SAW is even better, but automation doesn't automatically, automatically have to mean you must use a SAW. There are a couple of these um, CTI platforms that have levels of automation built in. They also help you quickly prioritize your security concerns. They're able to help you integrate your multiple feeds rather than individually monitoring uh, feed by feed by feed, and thus you actually speed up your investigations. And they assist with record keeping. Yikes, I am really out of time, aren't I? Uh, so, unfortunately, I then cannot tell you about how to use, um, there's this great tool, it's, it's by the NATO Admiralty Code System, what, and this is actually used for human intelligence, but the same principles apply. These are the caveats for you to consider when you want to know the reliability of info, and these are the caveats when it comes to considering the accuracy of info. And I am done. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you.